Hi, everybody. Uh, I guess I should get rolling. Hi. Hi, team. Everyone I've ever seen at this conference ever who's in attendance this year. So this is my first talk uh, at a conference like this. I would say go easy on me, but we all know I probably haven't earned that privilege. Um, this is my talk about laser cutters. Uh, essentially, the reason I am starting with this lovely Christmas ornament is because my mother brought it home when I was six years old from Corning, New York, and I looked at it, and it was the most fantastic piece of the future I had ever, ever seen. It is glass. It was made in the 1980s on a laser cutter that cost $35,000 in the 1980s. So it cost all the money. Not some of the money, all the money. And of course, because I was six, I instantly wanted one, because you know, you're six. That's what you want. Um, I wanted one. I wanted a dragon of my own. I was never really a ponies and unicorns kind of girl. So laser cutters. Big, scary laser. They are no longer for just your remaining eye. Laser cutters are pretty cool. They're pretty cool because they are a piece of the future you can own right now, even though they are very old. I mean, they are older than I am. They are older than practically everyone in this room. And recently, of course, thanks to scales, you know, the, the wonder of, of uh, manufacturing in foreign countries, they've become very inexpensive. You can get lasers in a wide variety of places. You can get lasers here in North America. You can get them from Epilog. Uh, a lot of people know about the Epilogue lasers. Um, I'm pretty sure that dragon was cut on a Universal Laser Systems laser, which are manufactured in Arizona. They're great. They sometimes charge you as much as $50 a bottle for some soapy water to clean your laser. That's fantastic, isn't it? I mean, you know, it's fantastic for them. Let's, let's, let's do this thing. Let's make sure that we have the future in $50 bottles of soapy water. So the pro for buying lasers, and this is, this is the start of it, is the pro for buying a laser from here is that they are not scary. So if you want an epilogue, you can get an epilogue. They're not scary. They plug into your box. They plug into your Windows computer. You hit go, and it lasers, sort of. It might light on fire still. You still have to tune it. You still have to work with it. It's still a tool. But the pro is that they work. The con is that they're still a starter kit. Uh, the ones that you can afford will be around $5,000, and they will still be a starter kit. And I think that we know from some slides later on in this talk that starter kits are starter kits. They're wonderful. You buy them, there's a kit, it comes with one LED, and you plug it in, and you put the nine volt battery directly on your LED, and the LED goes and there's magic smoke, and, uh, and you don't know where to get another LED, and you have a starter kit, so maybe you put your starter kit on the shelf and you never touch it again. That's what starter kits are for. They're there for you to experiment, but they're not there for you to make amazing things. They're there for you to start to learn. So Epilogue manufactures a lovely laser kit, and it's a zing, and you can do great work with it. And I have never worked with one, because I decided to get together with my buddies and buy something else. So the pros to buying sketchy Chinese laser cutters. There are many. There are many. Um, reading the putting together book, the manual for the laser cutter, is a great experience because you get to kind of figure out how Google Translate works. That is a great thing. You get to go through all of the translations and you get to find out what they meant. Leading the power to the flower pot means don't forget to ground your laser. Um, soft dog, we found out, is uh, the word for a software dongle. We now use this a lot around uh, our hackerspace, Site3. You know, the pro to this is also, in addition to the funny parts of setting it up, is that it's still a 60-watt laser. It just didn't cost you all your money. And it probably will do a lot of the same things that the other laser did. So one of the downsides is that there's still a lot of malware in it. Our laser came pre-registered with, I think, three, five different kinds of malware that were just there with the software. We, we attached it to a different computer. Nobody ever puts anything into that computer that directly goes into any other computer because we don't know what the malware does. So the pro to that laser, the big pro, is basically this number. Remember that dragon? OK, that dragon was glass, and I can't cut glass. But I could definitely engrave something that was the quality of that dragon. And it is not that much later for a tenth the cost in you know numbers. In actual value, I mean, $35,000 in the 80s was an unbelievable amount of money. Um, $3,300 now, that's probably about what some of you paid for your tricked out gaming rigs, which, that's great. You're gonna have an awesome time not in the real world on your awesome gaming rig. That's my bias. The reason I want to make amazing things is because I once installed World of Warcraft, looked at it, looked at it some more and thought, I bet I could learn to climb a cliff instead of having to fly a griffin. 
This laser cutter is an extension of that ideology, and it is the ideology of making amazing things with your time instead of making amazing things that other people have already made that they get to control your experience. With a proper tool like that, that is an industrial laser cutter. It is a proper tool. If you get it in your eye, you're not going to have an eye. If it blows up, you have to buy a new laser tube. You have to learn how to use it yourself. One of the big pros of that is that you learn to work with actual tools, and then you can make amazing things in the real world with a great deal of finish. I don't see very many of the people who I know are at this conference right now who focus on crafting. Uh, and I really wanted to take this in a crafting direction because that's why I wanted a laser cutter. A lot of people want laser cutters because they want to make you know, nicer enclosures for their equipment, things like that. I wanted it because I believe that if you have professional quality tools, you can put professional quality finish on things that you just did on the weekend. And I think that that is probably the point of the future in manufacturing, in local production, in rapid prototyping. I think that that is a pretty good part of the future. So here we get to the interesting part. How do you raise $3,300 if you are not employed in, say, manufacturing intranets for art galleries or building amazing anti-malware solutions? The answer is subscription. Subscription is a really interesting topic that I have now buried under the you know, fancy laser cutter, but really this talk is about subscription. Subscription is something you're very familiar with. Um, none of these things is not like the other. This is a magazine. You subscribe to magazines. This is an art gallery extension. You subscribe to get into an art gallery extension, too. And this is a laser cutter. You subscribe to get laser cutters. Subscription, not just for magazines, the gym, and religion. You can subscribe to many things. And what subscription basically means is when you get together a group of people and you pile them all into one big vat and then you buy a big thing with it. In terms of religion, this is usually a church. They build huge, beautiful cathedrals. That's a subscribed project. So is anything you see on Kickstarter. That's a subscription. What you are subscribing to is the big thing that you get a small part of. So when you subscribe to a gym, what you are doing is paying the overall costs for the access to the equipment, and you don't get to keep the equipment. You get to use the equipment. When you subscribe to a magazine, what you are paying for is the journalism. You are paying somebody to go out and research a really good story, and the journalism is what you're making. What you get out of it is a physical artifact. So if you want to do something like a Kickstarter or a subscription-based investment in any project, the best way to do it is to be making something out of what you want to buy with the subscription. So if you are buying a laser cutter, the thing to do is to promise people various laser cut things as part of their subscription fundraising package. So you know, if you want to fund one of these, say that you will cut them out X numbers of fish for every $50 they give you, and they get laser cut fish, and you get a laser, which can laser a whole hell of a lot more than just a fish. Um, the other thing, though, is that Kickstarter charges fees. And Kickstarter can get stuff from all across the world, and you can raise truly amazing amounts of money to do incredible things on them. But if you're from Canada, then you have to route things through sketchy bank accounts in the United States to get at it. And sometimes that doesn't work so well for us. I'm aware this is not relevant to an American conference, but still. You could also just get some friends together. And this is why laser cutters seem to be the egg from which hacker spaces hatch. Eventually, if you are going to buy a large piece of industrial equipment that is likely to off-gas at some point in its life chlorine, you need a place for it to live. So one of the things you can do with a laser cutter is you can get a bunch of friends together and say, hey, guys, we're going to buy a piece of the future from China. <laughs> and then you do. You get them together, you buy a piece of the future from China. And now you have to figure out where you're going to put your piece of the future. Is it going to be your buddy's basement? It can be your buddy's basement. Is it going to be the local church? It can be the local church. It can be anywhere. And that's great because now you have friends. You have to be friends because you bought a laser cutter together. And if you stop being friends, you don't get to access the future anymore. This is a pretty great way to stop having interpersonal drama with people. No, no, we're staying together for the sake of the laser. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> 18 what, Mr. Seth Hardy? 18 what? Friends are another word for idea generators. Here are some of my favorites in Ontario. I'm also very keen on HackLab, but I couldn't find a copy of their logo in short order. 
Hackerspaces, chicken egg problem. This is a photo of me and some of our members at site three. We are loading a bunch of equipment from another one of our friends in Scarborough. It's dirty, it's covered in paint. We probably all have respiratory illnesses now. <coughs> um, your friends will help you by making you think of things you wouldn't have thought of before. This is Jonathan Guberman's Tinked. He designed a monome. It is a lovely musical device. It is wonderful for doing, I don't know, what do you do with monomes? They're pretty boxes, they're full of lights. As you can see, huh? Uh, it's glow. I mean, that's really why it's in my presentation. Look, shiny. Come on, be distracted, shiny. Um, the thing that Jonathan and I talked about a lot when we were first getting the laser and setting up the laser, and this was at Hack Lab, was uh, that he had this habit of making projects, and getting them started, and they'd be wonderful, and he'd put together the, you know, the boards, and he'd set up the electronics, and they'd glow. And that would be great. And then he'd put it in a shoebox and never look at it again. I am pretty sure this is not a problem that only Jonathan has, because I also have that problem. I like to design something and then put it to one side, and then it gathers a lovely thick coating of dust, and I could use it to trigger allergies in my enemies, also my friends, but I don't think that it's the best project ever. It's fine for a demo, not the best project ever. This is better, I know, please, please overlook the fact that we've mostly got a shot of it looking pink and turquoise. This is better than the preceding slide because this is something you can hang on the wall and have other people look at, which as we all know, picks or it didn't happen. Either people see how great your work is or it sits in a box, at which point it doesn't exist. We know this. We know this because we have all come from the internet and if you don't let other people see your work, it might as well not exist. That's just the way it is. It might be very rewarding to you personally and I'm okay with that. If that is what you are after, that's great. This is again an ideological point. I want credit for my work. And therefore, I apply to hacker cons and give talks on it. This happens. This is an ideological difference. It's not a point of judgment. I think this is better. I think this is better. I think more finished box is better. He paid to have it professionally framed as well as cutting out a very exact thing on a laser which, you know, the laser is what allowed him to do such exactly perfect squares. It is what allowed him to do that grid. You can't really do that by hand. I mean, you can try, but that's why we invented lasers, so you don't have to. Um, where's the next one? <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> I think that that's pretty much the follow-up to that point, is it's beautiful and technically complex. Um, a lot of the stuff you can do with lasers you can't do by hand. That's why I love them. I love them because they make the future accessible. You can do stuff with them that if you tried to do it by hand would involve a lot of acid. Not that type of acid. The type that comes in large glass jugs and if you splash it on your hands, you'll be going to emergency. Just like me. Um, not what happened. So this is something that was made with a vat of acid. It's uh, a print pulled from a copper plate by a Canadian artist named David Blackwood. And I know I just snuck art in here, and that is also scary. But he is a master of, of the art of putting acid on metal plates and then putting some ink in the acid, in the grooves on the metal plates, and pulling beautiful images of Newfoundland out of that process. This is one of the many fun things you can do with lasers. Go figure. You can draw a picture, and you can put it in your computer, and you can have the laser do all of that work for you. You can have the laser engrave the plate, you can scrape the ink over it, and you, too, can make an absolutely beautiful, perfect print. This isn't something that generally gets advertised when you're thinking about lasers. Usually they just show you the Aztec calendar and, and then you think, oh my god, I could make such amazing things. And you get the laser there and you, you have a laser now. So, you know, you demo your badge, you write your name on it, you do something like that. And then you kind of forget about it and it becomes another tool that sits off to the side. And, and what I'd like to challenge people to do is simply once they get access to these tools, once they pass the chicken and the egg test, they set up their hacker space or they get access to one at, you know, tech shop. I'm sure some of you are from California. The goal there is now to go past the fact that you own a piece of the future because like I said earlier, you don't really own a piece of the future. You own a piece of the 1980s. That's not the future anymore. <laughs> the future is smaller and bigger all at once and it's right now. And one of the things you can do in the future is you don't have to mess around with nitric acid to make incredibly beautiful etchings and engravings. I care about that because I care about art. You might care about that because you care about accurate enclosure labels. You know, that, that's just right there. <coughs> I'm afraid that the lineups on this is... Yeah, so here's the second part of why you want 
to not get too hung up on owning a piece of the future. The thing you do with a MakerBot is you do MakerBotting. You get the MakerBot, you take the MakerBot apart, you assemble the MakerBot, the MakerBot melts its thermocoupler, it melts its heat gun, it melts its other parts, and you end up with beautiful pieces of the future that are not quite there yet. That is why instead of buying an epilogue starter kit, which is a starter kit, which is also what a MakerBot is, it's a starter kit, you want to do your best to buy good tools when you are putting these things together. This is another ideological point. I believe that when you have bought your tool by subscription, you don't want to be paying your people back with shot glasses that have melted to one side. You want to pay your people back with amazing, perfectly lasered fish. I'm using fish because I recently made a set of wedding toppers for some friends of mine. It didn't take very long. It took about 20 minutes, and they're perfect, and they're beautiful, and they're going on their wedding cake. The future. Um, Maker botting is not the same as making things. I know a lot of people join hackerspaces because they like maker botting. I mean, I genuinely like maker botting as well. I like hanging around and talking about the best way to make a tool work and um, gossiping about the ins and outs of this one tiny project I'm working on. But what I would rather do instead of maker botting is make something awesome for no good reason because a friend of mine said, hey, can you make this better? Yeah, I can make this better. And then I can make it happen. Um, these are some things that I made and uploaded to Thingiverse. This is another thing. Thingiverse is, uh, Thingiverse is fantastic, isn't it? I mean, has anybody here actually hung out on Thingiverse for any period of time? It is pretty amazing, right? Like, it's this giant library of every incredible variant on a clock that could be made in the 1800s by hand that you would ever want to see, except now you can print it on your laser. That's just, that, that's unbelievable, and it's part of the, you know, unbelievability of the internet. The thing is that a lot of people buy pieces of the future, lasers, maker bots, and then they print other people's visions from the future out on their maker bot or their laser. And that's still not the same as making things. That is still not the same as making things. That's making someone else's thing. Now you've got your, your laser, you've got your maker bot, you've set it up, you are making someone else's thing, which is also great as practice. You know, maybe you want to print out a thermo, you, know, you want to print out uh, a shot glass on your MakerBot to test how it's going to melt and light itself on fire this week. That's fine. <laughs> that would be a great use of your time. But I would rather actually make something for myself. And I think that a lot of people who go to these conferences would also rather do that. So here's something I made. This is slightly out of order, but this is the drawing file for and final product of a Kami Pinko bicycle, because I am a Kami Pinko cyclist, which is, in fact, how I did in my finger. Um, this is supposed to be a little bit later in the presentation, but what it is is basically a drawing that I did from something I found on the internet that I then output it on the laser, and then later I made necklaces out of it and gave it to all of my fellow hippie bicycling friends, most of whom still have intact fingers. Um, so let's get into the actual bit of this where I tell you how to make your own thing, which I think is more interesting than maybe the rest of what I've been doing. This is a legitimate use of, for instance, Adobe Flash. To work with laser cutters is pretty easy once you get one. Uh, one of the things I de-emphasized earlier is just that the reason you want to buy a professional tool instead of necessarily revamping an older laser cutter you find on Craigslist or buying the lesser laser cutters is because you want a tool where your input is minimized. You want to minimize the friction of getting your file from your computer into your laser and then out the other end. Because the, the, the less friction you have on that, the more likely it is that you're going to actually take the time to experiment with the equipment that you've just bought. If it's a pain in the ass to use it, you're not going to use it. Y'all know this. This is why automatic transmissions are popular. If it's a pain in the ass to use it, you're not going to use it. So. This is probably the most informational slide I have. This is my process for working with our laser. This is a legit use of Adobe Flash. I can draw fairly well. So I use Adobe Flash. I draw pictures. I trace pictures I find on Google Image Search. Then I copy them into Illustrator. I export the relevant file. I import it through several layers of sketchy Chinese software. I hit print. It comes out the other end of my laser, and I get to keep the files. And if I put them up online, they look like they make sense. Um, Google SketchUp is also brilliant for this because you can actually design most of your gears, lay them out, figure out how they're going to work together for free. Um, and then through a plugin, you can export DXF files, which is what our laser, the Gwaik, uh, talks to. Most lasers talk to either DXF or to G code. G code is, to my mind, slightly less to be preferred because it does not interact as well with actual drawings. So if you do a sketch 
um, and you scan the sketch and you transfer the sketch into the appropriate Illustrator files, into vector-based files, and then you put it out. G-code can be more dodgy than the DX apps, but that's not really the point. The point of this entire thing is to reduce the friction of this whole process. Get some friends together, buy the thing, make some things, and this is the last step. Um, Adobe Illustrator is what I actually use for the vast majority of my work. I use it because I hate Adobe Illustrator, but I've also been using it for 10 years, and therefore I hate it in extremely predictable ways that I can control. When it makes mistakes, for me or for my friends, when other people are getting into the laser, I can correct them. I can be like, oh yes, that is the path tool. It does not work the way you think it works. Um, that's very handy because, again, that reduces the friction of building something amazing. That's what you want to do. It's probably a good idea before you get into making really awesome, cool, whatever, to do a little bit of drawing. This is not drawing that is scary drawing. This is not drawing like that technical, wonderful, beautiful shot of Newfoundland I showed you earlier. This is drawing where you sit in a room for a few minutes every day and you go down this way, up that way, down this way, up that way. What that's teaching you to do is just control your hand and then you can do terrible sketches on a napkin that are basically stick figures that would shame XKCD and you can scan them into your computer using a scanner and then you can perfect them using any of the drawing software out there which is why I work with illustrators because whether or not I am having a good drawing day once I put it through flash and go smooth curves, whoop, perfect, excellent. That's what computers are good for. So you take your idea, you put it on the paper, I would suggest learning a little bit about drawing because it will make it easier for you to think. Drawing makes it easier for you to think because you're thinking about what you're doing with the pen, you're not thinking about what you're doing with your computer, you're not irritated about Google, you're not watching your Windows update and or whatever max answer to Windows update is going on. What you're doing there is you're just kind of thinking through an idea. Give yourself permission to do that because that will make your work better. Giving yourself permission to do that makes your work better. Um, the answer to all of these questions is basically image search patience who pays for software anyway equals laser files. So you want to use Inkscape. You can do that if you are drawing gears for clocks that could have been made by hand in the 1800s. You can do that. That's fine. So here we go. This is an actual rapid prototyping process. I'm really sorry that the bike slipped in earlier. Idea at work at 3 p.m. Your friend text messages you and says, for instance, <laughs> I hate this place so much, I want to shoot everybody on fire with the power of my mind. And your friend writes back and goes, you know, I bet I could do that. So this one, in this instance, was, ha, 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 all pigeons are sky rats. What's the most poisonous color of UV reactive acrylic that's available on the market today? Oh, it's neon green, and there's this thing coming up. Maybe we'll do that. So the first step you do is you go to Google, or I guess you could go to Bing, but, you know, they just steal their results anyway. Pigeon flying. In this specific instance, I stole this image here and this image here and maybe one or two others that were on the next page. So you go to image search. This is the part where you do this without drawing, so pay attention. You go to image search. You trace things. I traced this in Flash, um, so all of this fancy stuff in here, that's me going bloop, bloop, bloop with the pen tool. I just pick the pen tool up, I put it down, it drops it in. I kind of grab a, one of the handles, I pull it out to the side, I spend some time on it. Yes, there is no easy answer. You're not going to get the amazing, perfect first shot. This particular drawing took me around six hours to do, and this bit in here, all of this stuff here, that took forever. And also two weeks after forever. It took me months to get that right because I was working with it independently. And so easy things are hard. Practice, work on it. It will, it will get better in time. This is, again, in Illustrator. I took some calipers to a standard coin cell battery, like the ones that are on the back of your badges, hopefully, by now. And I dropped the appropriately sized circle through there. I took some calipers to the height of acrylic I wanted to use. You get acrylic at plastic supply companies. You find those in the yellow pages, the actual paper yellow pages, for preference. Um, you drop the battery in there. You hook the throwy up through the battery. and. Okay, well, that is out of order as well. But basically, then you end up with glowing green flocks of birds. But I missed an amazing step in there. And the amazing step is, this is what the laser cutter lets you do. What I just did was I stole some images off of Google, stealing. Um, then I traced them, which you get told not to do sometime in high school, and then everybody stops drawing. Because um, it's very, very difficult to learn to draw without doing that. And then 
I took my perfect image, I put it on the laser cutter, and I sat over the laser cutter for 16 hours while it off-gassed plastic fumes. And then I assembled everything by hand and found out that you don't actually have in hanging things a single perfect center of balance. Turns out if you assemble something by hand, the center of balance on every single item you make will be different. Live and learn. Make copies. Make hundreds of copies. Make as many copies as you want because what a laser is is a copying machine for ideas. And what art is is a repeating idea that is caused by jokes that you have with your friends at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. You better believe it, seriously. Sorry, back. That was not what I meant to do. Um, so yeah, after you make copies, make awesome. Just work out what it is that you're going to do with that, hang it up, and let other people see it. There is, just completely lost my turn of thought there. Make awesome, make other people see it. Make your thing, because now you've made your thing. You had a low friction process, you were well supported by your friends all the way along because you had to make a hacker space to house your laser. And because you have so many people who are talking to you now, you have these ideas, and then maybe you want to have a party, and then you hang up all of these things that you've made, and it actually seems pretty easy in the end because you weren't scared. Because you had some friends, and they might have laughed at you and gone, why the hell are you making 150 pigeons? They're, they're sky rats. And you're just like, come on, it's a cloud of neon green sky rats. They're <laughs> awesome. They glow in the dark. They're terrifying. You make some awesome. You laugh maniacally and you let your friends and subscribers take terrible photos of you because what you've made is not just pigeons, what you've made is not just one awesome thing, you haven't done it in your basement on your own, you have joined forces with other people, bought a piece of the future, and then used that piece of the future to make another piece of the future. I love that photo. The end, now go make something awesome. Plug, buy the Godzilla shirt, I made it, and you're not Detroit. I promised a half an hour talk, I think I may have actually gone under half an hour, maybe over, I don't know. Yeah, just about half an hour talk. So that's your half an hour talk on buying pieces of the future. I am perfectly willing to use the next half hour to talk about hacker spaces, why you should join a hacker space, why you shouldn't join a hacker space, what I think about places where you buy a gym membership to belong is versus belonging. But this is my half an hour and I said I would do it and it's done. So, any questions from the audience? Uh, have you put up any of the information on uh, how you bought your laser, um, information about the laser that you have? I, I have a, we, have, we have a hackerspace in Huntsville, Alabama that I've been looking at um, getting a laser for. All right. Um, we're just going to quickly rewind. Boop, 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 boop. Trace things. Trace things. Seriously, trace things. Then your hand gets strong and you can draw. Um, don't buy MakerBot. Um, So that website there, wklaser.com, these are a Chinese laser manufacturing company. They are kind of popular on the internet because they have amazing customer service. Amazing customer service. If you can put up with a little bit of Mandarin to English breakup, they are awesome. They're wonderful. They're very supportive. And a laser from Guayk costs about $3,300 Canadian. We paid $4,000 after we'd landed it because we have 13% sales tax in Ontario. I would go for one of these lasers practically any time. The, uh, the calibration period is nerve-wracking, and things sometimes break, but I would totally vote for these guys. They are ace. We have not had any laser fire problems. If you calibrate things properly, it can cut through anything an epilogue can to almost exactly the same resolution, probably the same resolution in real life. Ours is 60, 60 watts? Ours is a 60-watt laser. Um, one of the most important things when you are working with a laser for real is stand over your laser while you are testing new material. Stand over it because it will light on fire. Acrylic has a flash point, wood has a flash point. Um, linoleum has a spectacularly low flash point and is hilarious to work with. I was, of course, trying to do printmaking with these. That's how I got into it. Um, so the most important thing is once you get one, stand over it while you're testing the materials. Do not leave your laser unattended. Stand over it all the time, but especially when you're testing the materials. Um, Make sure you have a fire extinguisher. Fire extinguisher is not just for Site 3, the hot shit hacker space. Oh, that was recorded. <laughs> <laughs> My mom is going to see that. Fire extinguishers are very important. Proper safety gear is very important. Watching over your laser as it off gases is very important. You will only have to breathe in one lovely lungful of acrylic smoke in order to 
decide that you never want to touch a piece of off-gassing plastic again. Most of my work is not actually in plastic, contrary to what this shows. Uh, I usually work with veneer. The other thing is that firing the laser is all very well and good, but you don't actually need that high power to laser to do most of this work. The 60 watts is nice. Um, if you're going to just be cutting acrylic, you can probably make do with 25. You do multiple passes, because multiple passes mean that you get a smaller kerf, which is the technical name for the bit that disappears when you hit it with a laser, and, and less chance of fire. Basically, uh, if you, our laser can go through a quarter inch of oak. Uh, I found that out the great way by hitting fire the laser. And then the oak lights on a lot of fire, and you stop the laser, and you grab it out of the laser, and you wave it around for a while and dump it in the wood box. If you run the oak through eight or nine or 15 times at a very low power, though, you're going to get a nice clean cut with a slightly, uh, you know, a beautiful slight edging. So that's, those are the, the major, major tips I have for working with laser cutters. Um, new materials, be careful. Don't be afraid to try something new. I mean, really, I could have just titled this talk, Don't Be Afraid to Try Something New, or Art, Not Actually as Scary as You Think It Is, and I could go right ahead with that. Any other questions? Repeat the question. So, 25 watt lasers. Less expensive? Yeah. Um, new lasers are generally around, like you can buy epilogues at 30 watts, you can buy cheaper lasers, but I would advise against it. You want the 60 watt because otherwise one day you're going to want to etch granite and you're not going to be able to. I don't know. The first laser I ever experienced was found on Craigslist. It was a 25 watt universal laser systems laser. And the whole reason that I agreed to buy a new laser was because the wonderful laser that we rebuilt by hand, we redid all the electronics, we did half the software, it wouldn't cut an etch in the same job. Like, you could run a complicated cut line, like the pigeons, or you could run an etch job that was very detailed, but you couldn't cut out that etch job after. You couldn't set two different paths to do two different things. And that on its own was enough to convince me to spend $3,300, because the point of this is that the laser isn't the point. It's what you do with the laser that matters, because everybody has a laser cutter, or is going to have a laser cutter, because laser cutters are the eggs that hatch hacker spaces. And yes, Seth. Uh, roughly 18 by 24. Okay. Um, if you get one with a smaller bed, it'll be cheaper. I would also recommend going for the largest bed you can afford because, I mean, I hate to say bigger is better, but sometimes it's nice to be able to put a full sheet of acrylic into your laser cutter and simply hit go and have the whole job go. Um, that's the best reason for it. The smaller laser cutters are great um, and they're wonderful, again, for experimenting on, but, you know, if you buy a professional tool and treat it like it's a tool for making amazing things and think about what you want out of that, that's kind of the way to go with it. Um, you know, I, I ate a lot of lentils the year that we bought this. A lot of lentils. They were delicious right up until they really weren't anymore. Drew. Um, so you yep. For example, you said you couldn't cut glass. Um, what determines what you can and cannot cut? Like. Laser power, usually. The higher power ones can do it, but it's also things like refraction. Uh, glass is very tricky to cut with lasers because glass doesn't handle the beam very well. This is what our laser specialist tells me, anyway. Um, you can cut steel with higher powered lasers, but steel is not a great, metals aren't great to cut on lasers for a couple of reasons. One of them is that metal denatures. If you hit it with something really hot, it will fatigue more quickly, the edges will break, it melts. So if you're gonna be wanting to work with steel, I would say save up and go for a water jet instead because it doesn't have the heat denaturing problems on the sides of it. Lasers also can't cut brass because they reflect. So it goes and that doesn't really work. You can use um, etch compounds 
and things and put those down. Uh, we're experimenting right now with spray paint as a surfacing material. Uh, there are definitely a lot of hacks out there for laser cutters where you surface something like a PCB with uh, a, a silk screen of the appropriate lasering material and then you hit go and it, it rapid prototypes your PCB. And I know that that's something Think House is very interested in and Quartz Lab. I am less interested in this topic, but yeah. So the limitations are more or less, if you want to do those materials, look up a tool that will work on those materials. Lasers are not always the best choice. Yeah. Anybody else? Anything else? Crafting, finishing your work? Yes, sir? The back. Um, I was just curious. Uh, I was just curious. Uh, you said uh, a lot of the lasers off gas and just uh, just dump things out. Is it? Are there like uh, gas containment traps or venting mechanisms you can also purchase, or is it just Generally oh the lasers like going? Everybody get out of the room. Um, so when you install a laser cutter, one of the reasons why you are going to want to have at minimum a bathroom set aside with a window you can put the exhaust fan out of is that lasers generally come with a big fat exhaust fan on the back. We have a gigantic one, and you want to pipe everything from inside the laser to the outside of your space because everything you hit with a laser off gases. Wood, wood smoke is a form of off gassing, you know? Um, and most plastics have terrible things in them. If it has a C in it, you don't want to put it in the laser. So PVC off gases the same stuff that happens if you mix ammonia and, you know, bleach in your bathtub. Don't do it. You're going to need to have a space to keep it. If you want to keep it in your basement, you're going to need to take a fan, a proper ventilation fan, not just a giant one you bought at, I don't know, Walgreens. Is that a thing down here? You don't want to do that. You want a proper fan, and you want to output it to outside your house, because basically all burning plastic is poison. I mean, one degree or another of poison. You, you don't die in a fire of fire. You die in a fire of smoke inhalation. You don't die next to your laser of lasering. You die next to your laser because you breathed in quite a lot of horrible gas. Any other questions about safety, about these things? Do, 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 do. Derp, derp, derp. Yes, sir. Our hackerspace is site3.ca. We are part of the Southern Ontario hackerspaces, including, you know, Thinkhouse Diode, Quartz Lab. Yes. Um, yeah, so Site 3 is pretty awesome. Uh, the difference between Site 3 and many other hackerspaces is that I run Site 3 and therefore I care about people's projects getting finished and looking nice so that I can put them up on the internet. And the, the official tagline there is the hot shit hackerspace? We actually got named that by somebody else. It's because we mostly do fire art. Uh, cool. The laser is, is my favorite thing, but we mostly do fire art. So speaking of fire, you mentioned a fire extinguisher near the laser. I'm assuming that a, a dry chemical extinguisher would put lots of powder in the laser and, and you would spend the next week cleaning it out before you could use it again. That okay, I was... <laughs> Bravo, Trevor. Have you? Well said. Right. I was, I was going to say, have you tried a CO2 fire extinguisher? We really like ours because there's no cleanup. We've never lit our laser on fire. We relied on Thinkhouse to do our research for us in that area. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Where is James when you need him? I wonder. Um, yeah, so that's it. I think really the thing to take away from this is A, yes, lasers are awesome and you can get one of your own very, very easily. China will give you two separate customs bills, don't put that part on the internet, to, uh, you know, one to show customs and one to actually keep for your records. It, they're very helpful. They really would like you to buy things from them. Just go and take advantage of the horrible, horrible globalization because it's not that horrible. Use it. Um, and the next thing is, though, and really the point of it is, don't get too focused on the tool. Whatever your tool is, it's just a tool. You can probably do just as good work with a different thing if you were using a stick and some sand. But we live in the future. You have access to these things. They're not that expensive. Reduce the amount of concern you have with the thing and start making just something amazing. Just joke with your friends. Make, you know, gag gifts, giant sharks in tanks of formaldehyde, drop it off on their porch. Force them to have 76 lasered Care Bears show up on their lawn. <laughs> Build a steampunk rhinoceros to crush your foes before you and take their teeth for the teeth jar. That's my speech. That's, that's it. I'm done.